What's going on folks? This is Jay Ghost and we are starting to do a diagnosis of publishers in the gaming industry as well as going into a lot of details about economics, politics, and everything else. Now one thing that I'm going to sit here and say to everybody out there, please, please, please do not shoot the messenger. I mean, there's going to be a lot of things said here that you may not agree with. I leave the comments open. There is criticism. I may get some things wrong. This is a preliminary report. This is not necessarily the full ordeal that I'm going to be going through. I may be changing information. A lot of things are going on. So I want you all to be very ca cautious, uh, very understanding of the fact that I'm not going to get everything wrong. I'm going to be bringing up a lot of uncomfortable truths. Some people might not like them, but they're going to be out there. And I want people to sit here and think about it and then look into it with their own information. And that sits here and makes the reporting a lot better. Now, the reason that I sit here and talk about publishers first is because I want a lot of people to understand that you have to focus on the top. You have to focus on the people that have all the money right now and how they got into the positions that they've gotten into. Now, this is an unscripted, so don't sit here and think that I'm going to have a whole bunch of things. I'm kind of doing this more off the cuff, especially with this being a preliminary report. So what can we talk about in regards to publishers that people may not really look into? Well, after looking at them for the last 30, 40 years, I've basically sat here and looked into them holistically. And they have a few behaviors, no matter if they're a Valve or an EA, they sit here and do things a very specific certain type of way. They act very similar to bankers in any other industry or any other field. The only thing is that they have a product which we all sit here and can enjoy and quote unquote consume in some way, shape or form. It doesn't matter if it's EA, Valve, Warner Brothers or anybody, they all have a product that we can put into our hands and sit here and say, we've gotten what we paid for out of this transaction. Well, nowadays that's not happening quite as much, but that's still something that should be recognized and understood. They are a type of business and organization. Now I've gone into this more with the Capcom report and criticized the the annual report but the reason that I haven't gone into a lot of annual reports is because I keep seeing the same thing over and over so I want to talk about the entire industry holistically and hopefully this helps better reporting in the near future what I'm trying to sit here and get at is that if you want to look at what where the money is going how the money is flowing you have to focus on these publishers as the financial backbone of the entire gaming industry because there's so much concentrated wealth at the top the fact of the matter is that's going to affect the type of games that are made both within the corporations as well as outside of the corporations in the gaming industry for example you're not going to see a lot of well-made rts games outside of blizzard the reason is that a lot of developers are concentrated in Blizzard, have been around Blizzard, have been in their studio in California for a very long time. Now, the reason that I sit here and I talk about it this way is because no matter if you're doing FPS games or anything else, you're not going to have that concentration of quality polished developers like you are anywhere else outside of Blizzard that does RTS games. We kind of see that each of these gaming studios specialize in certain types of games. Squaresoft, for example, they specialize in RPGs. EA has been for a while specializing in a number of products like NFL where they hold and maintain a monopoly. You have to think of them as a type of bank. And on top of that, when I did the Capcom annual report for 2013, I made that very same argument within it. 
where in the back of where at the back of it I was talking about the fact that Capcom had money that was going to Chase Bank. I know a lot of people don't really recognize that, but you have to think of, because of that connection, that sits here and affects what type of games that Capcom is going to sit here and try to do. Right now, what you're seeing with Capcom or any other game, they're really sitting here and starting to pull into the banks of nostalgia far more than they're creating original content because they just don't have the money for it. The money is decided by whoever owns the most shares in the company, which is pretty undemocratic, but I'm leaving that for the Capcom 2013 report. If you wanna look at it, it's on my channel. Google search it real quick. I'm trying to make sure to sit here and talk about all of the publishers and what they do for the, for the gaming industry. Now, here's the thing that a lot of people don't really understand. If you look at publishers holistically, the Bobby Codex, the Johnny Riccatellios, the people that own the CEOs and everything, they're going to sit here and they look at things in a certain viewpoint in a certain way. They invest in a product, they expect a return. They expect a higher return on the product than what they put into it. That means that there's gambling on the type of games that are going to be made and created so this affects what type of games are going to be created whatever is going to be like the hotness right then and there that's what they're going to sit here and sell on the selling now here's the thing in two years that can change when we got a glut of first person shooters that was a whole bunch of ceos sitting here looking at these things and saying okay wait a minute We've got Battlefield here. We've got Call of Duty here. Everybody's sitting here. Go, 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 go. Make these first-person shooters. Make them quality products in two years. And then buy, buy, buy. And then all of a sudden, when people sit here and just dump all first-person shooters, well, where did all our money go? Now, the way to not invest like this is if you have a different corporate structure, such as Valve, who sits here and looks at products as a service. That runs directly counter to Call of Duty as well as the Battlefield models where you make a game, make it in two years, and then as soon as that goes belly up, you sit here and try to invest in something else instead of the game as a service, similar to how Valve has been doing with Counter-Strike, Team Fortress 2, Dota 2, where they just constantly sit here and keep the base model, keep the base product, and just keep it investing. Now, Blizzard tries something very, very similar with Diablo 3, as well as StarCraft, and they do the same thing with that other game, not Hearthstone. I know that's one of them as well, but I'm just drawing a blank. Wow, yeah, World of Warcraft. So, the point is that their model still has a few hiccups, but in regards to what they're doing they're improving it the quality as a service but blizzard's um blizzard's process is a little bit different they own their own servers similar to how team fortress owns theirs ea does the same thing but they would rather have you pay 60 dollars every time you want to plot pay for madden in 2016 whereas a lot of people sit here and they opt to do that type of thing but these are just some of the examples of what publishers are meant to do. They sit here, they find ways to part you with your money, and then if, if they're not scrupulous about it, they'll sit here and they'll take away the servers like EA has done for countless times and essentially make this so that every last server or everything that you want to pay for, you're going to be paying for it. Now, they can't get away with all of this when there's so much monopolistic competition, but the fact of the matter is, this is what they do. So, to tie this in, why are they tied to these types of business models? They want to make a return on investment to sit here and give it to the banks that are usually their highest paid shareholders. I don't see a lot of individual people that are making that much money to sit here and own the most shares in a company 
usually it's another corporation and especially a corporate bank and chase bank does a lot of speculation but they don't put their money all their money into the gaming industry this is something that you all have to sit here and recognize and understand some b banks decide what type of games get made because simply because they have the most stocks in a company these are things that are not being talked about not being discussed and this can lead to us not being informed about how strong or how weak the gaming industry is for example one of the things that i've just recently looked at was the fact that one of the top 25 game publishers out there is a company that nobody's probably ever heard of which is from china one of the top ones was called Tencent, and I'll have this in the underbar. But what this basically tells me is a lot of people aren't recognizing the strength of China in regards to what it's doing for game publishing. Now, just to put this into perspective and context, I play Warframe. Warframe is not a company that's owned by a Canadian company any longer. It's majority owned by a Chinese company called Layu Technologies. This company used to be a meat packaging plant, but they're recently going into game game development. So China is making a lot of money to be able to invest into a lot of different companies and products. Another thing that a lot of people don't recognize or fail to understand, Yu Suzuki did a lot of investment of Shinmui 3 into China. Shinmui 3 was first introduced in China outside of American markets and American products. We've been clamoring for that game for decades now. I think it was, what, 1999 or something? People were starting to cl clam up about Shinmui 3, but they find I mean, he's just now being able to do it, and he's being invested by Sony. Sony is, again, another top, one of the top three publishers, but you got to think about it. Sony is a Japanese company. They invested in Shinmui 3. Why is it being introduced into China first and not Japan and America? That was one of the questions that I had about it. But then you have to really think about it. China is growing into a, a superpower to rival the United States. And if you look at the politics and economics, there's a pivot to Asia that's going to try to harm China even though most of the American businesses that helped to invest in China in the last 25 years, that has not been talked about. Most of the companies and most of the jobs that you had in Michigan and all over the United States that has been just decimated by trade deals that started with Nixon. But the point that I'm trying to make is China has been getting stronger in terms of economic cultural power america hasn't invested in its own education and everything else so all of these have an effect of excuse me of who is going to sit here and basically influence the types of games that we can make we're all being given these massive distractions because publishers are slowly pivoting at least that's what it seems to me they're slowly pivoting towards China and investing in China because it's the biggest market out there. And that didn't come out overnight. I mean, Inafune, even though he built America for three million dollars, and he did that outside of a loan from one of the banks here, and he did that based on capitalizing on nostalgia of the Mighty Number no. 9 crew, He's still investing more into China than he is in America, especially with this recent Mighty Number no. 9, you know, I don't even want to call that a trailer, but wow, was that ever bad. Oh my God. Anyway, the point is, Inafune is investing in China. Yu Suzuki, investing in China. You have Sony, which is investing in Shinmu, which is investing in China. You have one of the biggest companies out there, which... Tencent is owning Paradox Interactive. You have a lot of acquisitions of the companies, like THQ is get, has gotten bought, bought out. You have a, a concentration of a lot of monopolies in the gaming industry that starts with all of the publishers that have effectively, just basically effectively, 
concentrated market. And with that concentration of market, they can influence what types of games are being bought. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no indie market. But when you're looking at the major publishers of, of the day, EA, you have Valve, that's a major publisher. They have great control over digital goods at this current point in time. This is why it's a big issue to sit here and look into um, Australia and how they're fighting and resisting these monopolies in any way, shape, or form. A lot of people don't recognize these monopolies for what they are. And that's exactly the issue. Steam has a monopoly in America. That is just a plain fact over digital goods. If you don't play the games on Steam, you're probably not playing it. And for a fact, with all of the ways that you can influence 7 million, I think, eyeballs on Steam with just your game being shown there and being put to the green light and then sitting here and using it to basically cultivate a number of products this all has an influence on all other aspects of the gaming industry so in order to really look at publishers you have to look at them as a type of bank they invest in the products that they can control. Similar thing happens with Facebook. They don't invest much in conservative views. So guess what? You're not going to get a lot of conservative views on there. A lot of their employees, that's a monopoly. They control the content that they curate. The gaming industry works on that same principle. And so publishers getting to have a monopoly is going to affect you in a negative way. Is going to affect developers in a negative way you have less options i mean people can talk about itch.io they can talk about this sura but who really knows anything outside of the steam monopoly or the gog monopoly i mean in terms of indie games gog for the most part has stayed to that nostalgia view uh nostalgia view while also using that money to promote witcher but the fact is all of this older money, all of these older products that should be, you know, free by now because of copyright laws and everything else, they're being controlled by these corporate monopolies. And these corporate monopolies are the publishers of the gaming industry. And this is basically how you can be affected because with their monopoly, we have to sit here and we have to deal with their rules that they have for the products in their, their, their ways. Counter-Strike, you can really can't play it without Steam. That's pretty much a monopoly. FTC licensing, blah, 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 blah. Uh, this is something that would probably be busted up in the past, but nowadays we don't really have a lot of uh, control over the industry unless we really want to have a new Teddy Roosevelt, which is probably not going to be happening anytime soon. I mean, there's plenty of other examples, but... In terms of publishers, I just wanted to sit here and say, you got to look at them as corporate monopolies. You have to look at them as a financial backbone because they've had concentrated wealth, which they've done for the last 40 or 50 years. I mean, I have a book here. Let me see if I can find it real quick so I can tell you all the title. Video Games Hardware Handbook. And that's from 1977 to 1999. Now, within those years, we've had three, four decades of console wars. So, I'm not going to talk too much about the console wars, but before the 80s, it was the ColecoVision and Atari. When you got to the 80s and the 90s, you had Sega versus Nintendo. And then after that, you had Sega... No, they, they left that. Nintendo, Sony, and then Microsoft. That was the new millennium. And it's been that way until fairly recently. Now, this goes and delves a little bit into that whole feminism thing that a lot of people like to talk about nowadays. What is different between what happened this new millennium and what happened with feminism and all this other stuff and the console wars in the past? Not one damn thing has changed. The fact of the matter is, if you look at it and just take a look at it, take a step back this seems a lot like fanboyism it's just 
it's turned into a political battle in some way, shape, or form with a whole bunch of feminists basically making the same arguments as a fanboy. And really, we've already dealt with this type of stuff. We've already dealt with it with logic and arguments. And most people that are actual fanboys of video games, you would know them and you would sit here and not pay attention to them. Unfortunately, a whole bunch of people sit here and look at feminism and then all of a sudden, that same fanboyism comes out in the same way. That's essentially what this whole fa feminist fanboyism really is. It's a fanboy, some fanboy nonsense. They heard something, they talk, speak a lot of nonsense, and it's just like sitting here and trying to talk to a fanboy. It's really, really, really just annoying. And it doesn't help the issue at all. But I'm not going to talk too much about that because I have an entire video that I have to do on that. But I just wanted to give you all a few of the topics that I'm basically going to be covering when I finally, finally, finally get into this. But this is just the preliminaries, as I said before. Don't shoot the messenger, as I said before. And I hope that you all got a, just a little hint of what the publisher issue really is. If you look at them as bankers, as corporate monopolies, you see that they really have a lot of influence and sway and because they've been accumulating money through the publishers and back deals that they've been doing, this has all helped to make them a lot more powerful than they really should be. Now this affects developers in a negative way and this affects gamers in a negative way. And hopefully with the examples that I've given, those can sit here and set you up to look into the gaming industry in a much more particular way. Look at these publishers and see the harms that they have done. And I haven't seen a lot of strength with what they do, but I could be wrong. Other than that, I'll see you all next time. I'm probably going to be getting more into the marketer side so that way I can sit here and I can actually talk about the feminism issue a lot more. See you next time.